different strokes, different strokes. Hi, my name's Derek. I'm so excited to be with you. <laughs> I really am. I really am. I'm amped to be with you guys this evening. Um, I'm always happier than I look. I'm, I'll apologize for that. Um, my wife, we've been together now for 20 years. <laughs> um, Rugby World Cup 95, 24 years. And uh, she still says to me, change your face. I, go, I can't, it's what I was born with. There's no way you were born like that. Uh, so, I've got a whole lot I want to share with you this evening. I think we're going to have a bit of fun. I'm going to scare you, intimidate you. Sorry, I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> you know, so often, I, I love what Greg was saying, where we, we, we need to start off with testimonies. I love testimonies for me. Uh, testimony to faith. I want to share a testimony with you. A lady in our church, um, chest pains, battling to breathe, goes to the doctor. The doctor gives her six weeks to live. Her, her lungs were full of tumors. Um, you should have that on the screen, please. So that is a cross-section of her lungs, and it's full of tumors. She had uh, less than five, between three and five percent functionality of her lungs. And uh, I keep this on my cell phone, so I didn't plan this. I keep this on my phone uh, because I need to be reminded sometimes that what we're doing is real. <laughs> Maybe you just got more faith than me. I sometimes need to be reminded that. Uh, anyway, so this is her, these are her lungs, full of tumors. Get six weeks to live. Doctor says to her, get ready, make your affairs right. She doesn't even want to tell her children. Her boys were about 8 and 11 at the stage. So if you cut her in half this way, we didn't do it. Um, Cut in half this way. This is looking at the cross section of her lungs, looking down. These are her lungs full of tumors. She's hardly breathing. And uh, she has six weeks to live. I don't know what you do when somebody tells you you have six weeks to live. They live an hour and 20 minutes away from our church. So they came to church every Sunday. And she's in church one Sunday morning. I'm thinking, six weeks left to live. I don't know if I'll go to church. She's there and she feels a heart attack kick in. She feels the cramping, she feels the pain. None of us know what she's going through. And she feels this pain and she goes to the specialist on the Sunday morning and they send her for an MRI, they check her heart, they send her for an MRI again, they say, you've put the wrong ID on the wrong MRI because we can't see the tumors. Can we have the second screen up, please? That's what her lungs look like now on the side. Now they cannot cut your lungs open and take the tumors out. But there's scar tissue on the one side. I can't point it out to you. Well, it, I can. On the right-hand side of that, you see those are the two cross-sections of the lungs. On the right-hand side lobe, just to the left, you'll see there's a, a thick bit of tissue there. That's scar tissue. Doctor, the Muslim doctor says a precision surgeon couldn't do this kind of job this well. And her tumor's gone. She's cancer-free. If that's how you applaud Jesus, that's sad. That's pathetic. That's pathetic. Wait until you've got a problem. Wait until you're facing imminent death. Wait until... I will not share testimonies with you if that's your response to my king stepping in. I'm serious. That's awful. Oh, she lives. Oh. But you'll pray for a salary increase. Wait, my notes say start off nicely. <laughs> I'll go to point two rather. What sometimes happens is we listen to somebody preaching and, and we think, well, if they're on stage, that means they must have every, everything together. They don't have challenges. So when they make altar calls for people suffering with sickness, they don't, you know, maybe sometimes on the odd occasion, maybe that guy has a chance. But you know, as pastors, it's always easy. We've seen in this house, that's not true. We've seen in this house, the devil comes for us. So I want to share this with you, just as a brief thing this evening. Every one of us is facing something. Every one of us is facing a challenge. Every one of us is facing a mountain. I don't care how much you think the person next to you has got it all together. They don't. There's an issue. There's a challenge. There's a problem. And they might not be in it. They might be coming out of it. And if they're out of it right now, chances are they're going back into another one. I want to show you another picture. If you can put that third slide up, please. That's my daughter's spine from the front. You see the S-curve? 
It's not supposed to be like that. That's supposed to be perfectly straight. That's supposed to be a perfect line. That, that curvature there, so what they want to do to my, she was my 13-year-old, is cut her, zip her up, back open, and fuse her spine from the base of her skull down to her lower back. They said, that's the only way she's going to function. We said, no. I'm a man of faith. I pray for people that have lung cancer. They get healed. Let me put a slide up for you where her back's straight. You don't have that one, do you? Yeah, because we don't have that yet. That's what it looks like right now. Ah, oh, let that reality set in. Let that reality. We are all facing something. So matter no matter how much bravado, no matter how much the person next to you is smiling and everything's okay, you pray for your friends. You pray for the people in this church. You pray for your leaders. You speak life over them. You declare healing over people. When people come to the front and they respond, somebody responded this evening, I saw you so, I'm going to chat to you at the end of the meeting. Came to the front when the invite was made. I'm really excited. But I want to tell you that we need to treat each other differently. We need to honor each other differently. Because that person that ignored you when they walked past you at church, they're not being snobbish, they're not being difficult, they're carrying a mountain. And they're just trying to deal with it. The person that sat in your seat and they really ignored you, they're just tired. Maybe they just need you to go and say, I love you, can I pray with you? I don't care how much Holy Spirit you're going to have in you. If you're not going to love each other, it means nothing. It's nothing. Else it's a show. If you're prophetic and you've got no love, you're a fortune teller. You're worth nothing in the church. You're worth nothing. I can dance the best. I don't care. Give me eight beers. I'll dance you. I can do this, I can do that. No one cares. Love each other. Love each other. I can tell you, your leadership team in this church loves you. I know you might look at me and you're thinking, ah, they put you on stage, we don't know anymore. <laughs> when people are healed, we celebrate as though you were healed. Because what happens in church, when we don't share testimonies, no one's faith is built. But the reason why nobody's sharing testimonies is when I shared a testimony, you were, I've seen you cheer. I've heard people cheer at sports stadiums. And they cheer people on that they've never met. Because one guy grabbed a ball and ran over a line. Who gives a flying frog? <laughs> Honestly, oh, rugby's my sport. Shame. We cheer for that. Watch. Are there people that watch cycling? <laughs> Dude, it's only a drug competition. Who got to take the most drugs without being caught? <laughs> if we're not going to celebrate victories, we're not going to share victories. That's what a testimony is. Try and start your meetings off with testimonies. Not with your leaders going around, please share something, please share something. And you get up and go, I'm just really happy to be alive. Because then we're not celebrating that with you. But there are things that are taking place in your life. Share it with the leadership. Go, well, I don't want to speak from the front, but it's funny, you wanted to come to the front when you had the prayer request. Oh, well, I don't speak well. So what? Well, what about me? We don't care about you. We want to hear about the goodness of Jesus. And the more we start sharing that, it becomes a hotbed for miracles. It becomes a hotbed. It's this, I expect to be healed. I was, I, I was healed. We were, we were traveling. We, I was, we were in Brazil on a missions trip, and I'd ripped my ligaments in my foot. And I couldn't go for surgery. I never had time because I wanted to go on this missions trip. Um, but you've all got other better excuses. So we go on this missions trip. I get healed during the meeting. I'm on the trip. I get healed. I'm standing there, and it's like, it's amazing. By the way, the ligaments still haven't joined. Two of them are totally ripped. I shouldn't be able to stand or do this, so it's amazing. Um, so, oh, we're learning, we're learning, we're learning. <laughs> if you're going to cheer like that, I'm going to make up stories. I swear, <laughs> I will fabricate testimonies. And I'm standing there. It's the craziest thing. I'm standing at the stage. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's amazing. And these two girls run into the church that we're at. And they're carrying their friend. And I go, 
what happened? One of them can speak English. And, and she says, my, we were just playing soccer, and my friend ripped her ligament, ligaments in her left foot. You know what? I've got faith that God healed that. <laughs> Set her up here. We lay hands on her. I don't know how many seconds later she's healed. So she jumps up. They don't stay for worship, indignant heathens. <laughs> they run back because they need to go back to their sports game. I said to her friend, are you saved? Yeah, 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 they know Jesus. <laughs> uh, another woman. I, would, I, had, I had three ladies that evening that we prayed for, got new spines. The one lady was 80. If you're older than 80, I'm sorry to say this, but I wanted my daughter who was 13 to get a new spine, not an 80-year-old. But the 80-year-old was doing cartwheels and touching her toes, and she'd never done that, so her whole family got saved. That's fun. That's fun. That's fun. And when no one went into theology, no one went, you see, because you're a sinner, you see, with Adam and Eve, the eternal sin, they didn't care. They just wanted to meet Jesus, the one that heals. Jesus, if he heals, he obviously saves, because why would he heal? if? He... Because there was reason to celebrate, because miracles are celebrated. You go, well, we don't know if miracles are taking place in the church. Share testimonies. When you start sharing testimonies, things shift. It has nothing to do with my preach, so I'm going to pray and restart. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I pray that it, everything that is of Derek may fall on deaf ears, but everything that is from the throne room of God, Lord, I pray that the assignment that you have given me this evening, Lord, may it be delivered accurately with power, strength, and signs and wonders to follow. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we wrap up Ignite, I, I'm grateful for the honor to come and chat to you. Um, it's been an absolute privilege. I, I love this church. I love your leaders. Um, I love Greg more now. Um. Don't laugh. I don't know why they're laughing, Greg. Okay. Um, but part of this, the, the plan behind this ignite, and it's you should realize this is now we're in the middle of the year, so we yeah, because I do it in our church as well. January we smack it, we launch, it's big. Everyone, everyone's acting as though they're energized, but they're bankrupt because their credit cards have been extended two way. They're paying off 90 day accounts, and it's just it's wild because they had a holiday. Because holidays don't really recharge you. Do you know that holidays just so you can spend time with the kids uh, and spend as much money as you possibly can access. And in January, so we start and we launch, we envision, and we. We get catapulted into the year, and we start losing a bit of steam because June, July comes, the holidays, it's getting a bit chillier, so we start losing personal momentum. And what I want to share with you this evening is I want to see you recharge, so the next five months are going to be so recharged because of what you're going to do that by the time you hit December, you're like, I can't wait for 2020. 2020 is going to be your, my, my year of vision. 2020 vision. <laughs> if you didn't get it, ask the person who laughed. <laughs> If they laughed and you asked them, what does he mean? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Just shut up. Because <laughs> life is draining. We all understand what draining is. We have cell phones. And we all know that our, our bedside tables have radically changed over the past 20 years. Before, um, I'd just have my pistol um, and the lamp. And now it's obviously upgraded. Now I've got a newer pistol. Uh, and it's a magazine and a torch and a longer pistol and my knives are stacked over there. <laughs> People say, what are you scared of? Nothing. <laughs> and, um, but at the same time, everyone's got little plugs next to their bed because we've got to make sure that our cell phones are charged. Got to make, God forbid, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, your cell phone starts saying 8%. Mine actually shouts at me. And it gets to 5%. And then it gives me this funny warning. At 30 seconds, it says, your phone is going to switch off in 30 seconds. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at my kids, and they can see the frantic look in my eyes. They go, we well, don't know where the cable is, Dad. I'm like, get the cable. It's going to die. You run as if you're running to an ER, and you're running, get the cable. You plug it in. It's like, it lives, it lives, it lives. We run around with power banks and extra batteries just so that our phones can be on because we can't afford our phones not to be charged all the time. But do we monitor our own charges? Are we monitoring our own energy levels? Are we monitoring how much time and energy we're wasting on life? Life drains you. 
All the single people, they're like, I'm so tired, I don't know what to do. If only I was married. If I can just get married. Those are married people that laugh, by the way. <laughs> I'm telling you, those are all married people. All the singles are going, no, no, no. But if you think getting married is going to solve your problems, <laughs> there's no singles counseling, have you noticed? <laughs> you don't have to be counseled on how to be single. Now, these single people sitting are thinking, what? But then we get married, and that's, that's, you know, they say love is blind, but my gosh, marriage is an eye opener. <laughs> and you get married, and you, hey, Greg, you've got two months to go, buddy. <laughs> Let me ask you, and no one can see your answer unless you nod. Has she changed towards you since you got engaged? <laughs> <laughs> She's gripping his hand, digging her nails and saying, for the better. <laughs> so what happens? We get married and our life goes, whoa. This is tough. If we have kids, now it will be better. Those people that are laughing now have kids. I've watched two grannies do this. I love kids, have kids. I call children sexually transmitted life group killers. Um, I mean that as a joke. I mean it as a joke. We have, we have life groups that have 40 kids in and 20 adults because our church is growing from the inside out. We have an incredible number of kids. It's special, but I'm telling you, if your marriage is in trouble, don't think kids are going to heal it. And if your marriage is in trouble and you have kids, your kids shouldn't be bearing the brunt of your inability to run a proper relationship. Amen. Amen. So there are things that drain us, there are things that are killing us, and we often don't know why. Why are we so tired? Oh, it must be the simple carbohydrates that we're eating at 11 o'clock in the morning. Let me tell you what the Word says. Micah 7 verse 8. Let me encourage you with this. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. You see, we have enemies. Christianity is not a picnic. Else we would have been given the tablecloth of God, but we were given the armor of God. You can't expect to have the armor of God and not be at war. So don't be shocked. And don't act so surprised when the enemy attacks. But you have an enemy. It's sickness. It's disease. It's fear. It's uncertainty. It's lack of resources. Financial ruin. Darkness. It gets us. You have an enemy. And if you doubt that, no, you don't. Rejoice over me. Rejoice not over me, O oh my enemy, when I fall. Let me tell you that just because you've fallen doesn't mean you've failed. It's just because it means that you're alive. We get to fall. And I'm not talking just in sin. I'm saying life happens. Death happens. Business is closed. Health issues hit us. Life happens. But do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. I love this warning. Enemy of God... Do not rejoice over me. My enemies do not get to rejoice over me when I fall. Why? I shall rise. You see, there's a guaranteed enemy, but there's a guarantee that you will rise again. And it's not self-help. It's a done deal. When I fall, I shall. It's a will. It's a guarantee. No matter how badly you've fallen, no matter how badly you've messed up, and no matter how badly life has dealt with you, When I sit in darkness, not if, when. When I sit in darkness. See, this is the problem. We don't always understand that depression, anxiety. Maybe you're sitting in a bit of a, a darkness because your bills are so high. Maybe you're sitting in darkness because the medical report has come back negative. Maybe you're sitting in darkness because there's a fog in your life that you cannot shake. There's this anxiety that you're dealing with in a depression, and you're so petrified to tell anyone because everyone then goes, oh, you just need deliverance. And there's a place for deliverance. Trust me, I'm a demon hunter. 
But the problem is we've gotten to a point now we're so scared that we're suffering from depression, we don't tell anyone because then it's a, a psychological issue. I'm telling you, when, when I'm in darkness, no matter how lost you feel, because that's what darkness does. If we switch off all the lights, you feel lost and alone because you're dark. You can't see any hope. You can't see anything. Scripture says when I'm in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. No matter how tired you are, no matter how burnt out you are, I'm telling you, you're called to be a solar-powered human being. I'm a solar-powered human being. The light of the world, Jesus Christ, He's charging me and He's empowering me. If you're being charged in any other way, if you're getting your joy in any other place, I promise you it's temporary. It's temporary. We need to be those people that we spend time in the presence of God and His light. What is His light? What is the light of God? His word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There was a word that came earlier, to be consumed by the word of God. I, I, I judge no one, but if you're not spending time in the word, there's very little word in you. If you're not going to get into the word, it's never going to get into you. Battery. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> we know we have enemies. We know there's darkness that can descend. What is the strategy for being able to deal with the challenges? What is the strategy for us to be recharged and re-energized? And it says this in Psalm 34 verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you know the goodness of God, you know that the fight is worth fighting. You know the journey is worth taking. You know the walk is worth walking. But it says taste and see. What are we called to eat as Christians? I'm going to hammer this really hard. So if you're a person that reads the word, this will be encouraging. If you're a person that doesn't read the word, this is going to be challenging. But either way, there should be some response in our lives. If you can go for a week without reading the Bible, I believe you starve to death as a Christian. And starved people, hungry people in the natural, are weak. There's a physical weakness that gets us if we don't have enough calories. There's a, there's a spiritual weakness that gets us if we don't have enough bread of life. And you wonder why you're not fighting well? It's because you're not eating well. Come on, we, know all the, we all know the keto stuff. We know the, the banting. You know, it's a slice of fat on ever for breakfast. <laughs> not knocking it, just not eating it either. Um... <laughs> They say, if you eat bread, what happens? You crave more. It's the same as the Word of God. The more you have, the more you want. The more you eat, the more you want. The more you consume it. Because God says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste the bread. But are we seeing the goodness of God? Are we, have we set something before our eyes? Scripture says in Proverbs 29 verse, verse 18, Where there is no prophetic vision... The people cast off restraint. Where there's no vision for their lives, if there's no prophetic utterance, if there's no prophetic sight in the spiritual realm, they're running around naked. That word cast off restraint means to take off your clothes. The Word of God says if you're running around without something of God in you, you're naked to the enemy. What should we be wearing? Armor of God. What are you running around wearing if you're naked? Nothing. I've had the privilege of being in a few fights. I believe every man at some stage in his life needs to be punched in the face. <laughs> Fivefold ministry. <laughs> I went, uh, we did this at one of our uh, men's evenings. The church is still small. Funny enough, it didn't stay small. But I said, who's never been punched in the face? And about 20 guys put their hands up. I go, come, line up. <laughs> See, he's got, we just, they're like, they just saw, yes, because you don't know your own power. You actually don't know the damage that you can inflict someone with a fist. And at the same time, don't mess with small guys because they'll knock you out as well. <laughs> they say dynamite, you know, dynamite comes in small packages, right? Yeah, but be careful of the big ones. So, <laughs> if you have no vision, if you have no prophetic vision for your life, you're running around naked. Point I was getting to. Whenever I've been in a fight, I've never taken all my clothes off. It could possibly be a way to win a fight. 
Because honestly, if I'm squaring up with a guy and he gets naked, I'm like, dude, you're on your own. It's <laughs> not someone films this. They go, Pastor. Ah. <laughs> we run around naked as Christians because we have no prophetic vision for our lives. Dads, do you have a vision for your family? Oh, good Lord, if they'll just pass. If that's how high you're aiming, chances are you won't even hit that. Well, if I can just make it to the end of the year. I mean, fruit flies have that life expectancy. If I can... <laughs> Husbands, what are your, what's your vision for you and your wife? You see, we battle to have our wives submit to us because we're not godly leaders that love them unconditionally all the time and show them the love of Jesus as we... Follow Jesus. You want your wife to submit to you. It's a crazy word, submit. My sister says it's a typo. It actually says summit, but it's actually submit. <laughs> yeah. If you want your wives to submit to you, pursue Jesus. And they'll, as they pursue Jesus, it's easy to submit. But do you have a vision for your family? And I'm not only talking about, have a vision for your family to take them on holiday. Take your family away. And if they behave well, bring them back with you. <laughs> Do you have a vision for your family where you want to see your kids when they're 25 years old? Have you taken out policies for them? Oh, I can't afford not to. So your financial inability and poor stewardship is now putting the burden on them. Oh, they can get a student loan. So you're saying that the world must provide for your children because you don't know how to because you haven't cast vision financially. Have policies for your children when they turn 18. Oh, you know, I never grew up with them with that kind of stuff, neither will they. You're a bad dad. Are you saying I'm a bad dad? Get the recording. <laughs> where there's no prophetic vision, I believe we need to actually have pictures in front of us that show us what we're pursuing. I have a picture when my phone boots up. It's funny, I had to restart and I lost it, but I've put it back now. When, when my phone, the lock screen, is a picture of 200,000 people giving their lives to Jesus. It's a mass crusade. 200,000. 200,000 people giving their lives to Jesus. From Islam to Jesus. From death, devil worship to Jesus. Because I'm trusting I will see that in my day while I stand and minister the gospel. That's, my, that's what I dream of. I, I, I have a, there's a prophetic word over my life that I'm a wrecking ball. The wrecking ball. I, a company I worked for actually printed a t-shirt of the church. They had a t-shirt made, the wrecking ball. The prophetic word over my life is you'll be a wrecking ball that breaks down religious mindsets and challenge religious spirits. If you're being challenged right now. So I have that as my background on my phone. And every time I look at my phone, I'm reminded, don't settle for what the world wants you to fit into, but pursue his presence and start breaking down whatever the enemy has set up and whatever man has set up as its structures. But I have it set before me because every decision I make, I want to make sure that the decisions I make on Monday are in line with where I want to be on Wednesday. And where I'm going to be on Wednesday is taking me closer to where God has called me to. I cannot waste days. I can't waste time. There's a prophetic vision that God has given me for my life, and I pursue it with everything in me. I'm, I'm crazy with this kind of stuff. I have pictures on my laptop of things that I'm trusting for. You know what's fantastic? My kids know the folder, and I show them, and they're things that I put on my laptop two years ago. I'm saying, look here. And they go, Dad, that's what's happening now. Yes. And Dad, that's what, yes. And Dad, yes. And my kids have learned that casting vision is more important than just having a dream. Oh, I wish. No, no, no. Cast vision. Where there's no prophetic vision, you're running around naked. When there's vision of where I want to be and where I'm going, hmm, I'll fight anything. We see this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. Hmm. Then the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people. He's speaking to Moses. Of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know they're suffering. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey and a whole lot of ites. 
You see, a word from God is enough and adequate to provoke you to have enough faith to start the journey. A word from God is enough to provoke faith in you for you to start the journey. You start the journey. God says to you, you will. As Greg spoke this evening, life groups being planted, prayer meetings being started, churches being planted, that word is enough to provoke you to start the journey. Let me show you this as well. Numbers 27, the Lord said to Moses, go up into this mountain of Abram and see the land that I've given to the people of Israel. He then says, when you have seen it, you'll be gathered. He, Moses is taken away. But he says to Moses, to complete your journey, you've got to see it. Get up on the mountain. I want to show you the promised land. This is the reality. If you cannot spy it, you won't occupy it. If you cannot see where your family is going, the devil will distract you and mislead you at every opportunity. You've got lists of... So I'll speak to the singles again. You've got lists. I speak to young girls, they have lists. The longer the lists, the later they get married. <laughs> but I'm telling you, have a list. Have a list of who it is that God told you you're going to marry. Not who you want. One young son, he comes to me with a list. I'm like, dude, this Eve couldn't live up to the standard. And bro, I don't think you're any Adam. You are living evidence of the fall of man. <laughs> no, the truth will set you free. I said to him, shorten the list. He said, what should I say? She must be born again. And, dude, if she says yes, take her. <laughs> and then I put, now, in all honesty, I put a few parameters in place. I said, this is what you are looking for. When he found the girl, he knew this is the one. You know how easy it was for him to put all other things aside and pursue the one that God's presented before him. The problem is we don't have any vision. So, oh, I don't know where I must work. I don't know where I must study. I don't know what I should be doing. If you have no prophetic vision, you're running around naked. You go home and you make a list, not of what you want. Go and make a list of Proverbs 3. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make straight your paths. Go and spend time in his presence and allow him to straighten your paths. Allow him to cast vision for you. Allow him to say, this is what I'm taking you into. And it might take three weeks, it might take three years. But I'd rather wait three years for what God has for me than wait three weeks for what I've set aside for myself. Because some of us are so busy trying to pick the lock of the door we want to see open. We pick the lock, we lie on our CVs, we lie to bosses, we lie in interviews, then we get the job, praise Jesus. Then you've got to do the job. You get fired. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God says, just be honest. Some of you, you're possibly not getting... Stop lying in your CVs. Oh, I've got him a trick. No, you don't. You cheated in grade 10. You made it through. Be honest. Be honest. Be honest. Some of you need to be honest with your wives about some of the stuff you've gotten up to. Oh. Oh, no, she'll leave me. No, she won't. Pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus. I want to encourage you, if you're listening to this, and your husband comes to you and he shares a couple of really difficult truths, please have grace for him. Vice versa. But we need to taste and see. You will not run the rest of this year well, with energy, if you can't see what God's calling you to in December and January. It's going to exhaust you. No athlete just runs. How far are you? I've done 37 kilometers. How long is the race? No idea. <laughs> Athletes will tell you, I've done 37 kilos. I'm doing 52. I know where I'm going to hit the wall. I know where I battle. I know where I get stuck. I know where my challenges are. But I know where I've prepped and I know where I've planned and I'm going to make it. Cast vision for your family. I used to practice preaching. I still am. I used to go stand at Beulah Park. I'd been saved for two and a half years. I used to go stand at Beulah Park. There are, there's a prayer mountain there, and I'd go and stand there, and there are a whole lot of impala. I used to preach to them. Got the whole lot saved. <laughs> You'll see they're not sinning. Just before I baptized them, I moved to Secunda. <laughs> I used to go and stand there, and as my family is my witness, Two and a half, three hours, every single night, I'd stand up there and I'd preach. And I'd preach and I'd preach. And while I'm preaching, I think, what absolute rubbish. 
what rubbish. And I'd go back and I'd change my notes. And I'd prep and I'd pray and I'd trust God and I'd practice different things and I'd move around. Because the first time, I'll share this with you, the first time I ever prayed out loud at a prayer meeting was when I went to Secunda. I was petrified of public speaking. People go, Pff. I was scared. This scared the smoke out of me. Speaking in front. The first time I heard my voice, I'm like, well, I'm never speaking again. Good Lord, how can everyone listen to that voice? I was too scared to stand up in front, so I went and I started casting vision for myself. I will stand and I will preach to those that don't want to hear me and those that can't criticize me until God gives me a platform. You all want platform and profile, but you don't have prophetic vision. Start. Prepare. You want to preach? Prepare one. You want to share a message? Get one. Well, I don't have a place to preach. Go to Beulah Park. I reckon they'll let you in there. Go and stand somewhere. I want to be an evangelist. I want to go to China. Go and stand. Supermarket, speak to somebody. Go and catch the bus to the next soccer tournament. Get somebody saved in a 16-seater. Offer to pay. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go offer to pay. I challenge you to do this as well. Not with me, on your own. Go and offer to pay for everyone to get into a mini taxi. You know the minis, the one that only takes 16 people? And you say, I'll pay if you let me preach. And you preach. I dare you. Go and get a good story. Don't let your next testimony be, I sat in church. Taste and see that the Lord's good. Write it down. Keep, keep track of what's going on. Learn how to speak differently. You're not going to see the end of this year well if your speech does not change. It says this in Proverbs 15, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. See, you cannot change your face, but you can change the noise it makes. <laughs> Although I've noticed this trend on Facebook. Now, I don't know how many billions of dollars are spent annually for people to look younger. They, they, we spend, not we, <laughs> they spend a fortune on trying to look younger. It's hair dye and uh, it, it, it's Botox, you know, they say... A few years ago, you know, no one really knew about Botox. Now you mention it, no one raises an eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> and some people are like, ho, 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 ho. And all of a sudden on Facebook, now you have this app that makes everyone look older. And we're all going, oh, look how good we're going to be when we look older. Another one guy's joking. He said, the scary thing about this app, it's amazing how many people look more like the neighbor. <laughs> What's coming out of your mouths? If your tongue is a tree of life, if in Proverbs 18 it says life and death is in the power of your tongue, I want to quickly show you a video. If you can run that video, please. Dr. Emoto has conducted another interesting experiment. He placed rice into three glass beakers and covered it with water. And then every day for a month, he said thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot. To the second, and the third one he completely ignored. After one month, the rice that had been thanked began to ferment, giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. And the rice that was ignored began to rot. Dr. Emoto thinks that this experiment provides an important lesson. This is done by a doctor, Japanese doctor. So obviously you use rice, we'd have to use another thing. Maybe in Italians would use pasta, we'd use pop. I don't know. <laughs> it's a scientific fact that your words have power even over inanimate objects. Your words have power and authority in your lives. Stop vomiting over yourselves. Because what happens is we take the word of God, we eat it, and before it becomes part of us, we bring it up because we speak against it. Oh, you know, I've got a bad memory. You probably have Alzheimer's. <laughs> you think it's funny. So does the devil. 
As soon as we align our speech with what the devil's saying about us, I've said it before, you're praying to the wrong God. What do you speak over your families? What do you speak over your children? You come with stupid nicknames. Critical of your wife, critical of your children. You speak death over your future. You speak death over your finances. You use social media to mock yourself and your family. Oh, this is typically me, and you'll have a joke about somebody who's clumsy. Oh, I'm accident prone, and the person's accident prone. They're not prophetic. They're just speaking over themselves. And it's not positive thinking. It's deadly speech. The Word says it. I want to give you two illustrations out of Scripture. Picture this. Jericho, Joshua 6. Now, Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around, march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. So they start. This is the plan. They're going to walk around. Verse 10. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. Verse 20. So the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down. It actually, it was pressed into the ground. It didn't fall over. It fell into the ground. So the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. They had a march around for six days. And Joshua says, don't speak. And then being silent allows God to get done what he wants to get done. Because else they'd march around and go, look how high these walls are. Look how strong these buildings are. We could never take it. We could never capture it. We could never do this. It's impossible. Look at the height. Look at the sickness I'm facing. Look at the financial ruin. Look at my marriage. Look at my children. Look at this country. And they'd be spewing death over what God had promised them. So Joshua says, shut up. Shh. I'll take you to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1. Zechariah says to the angel, the angel has said, said, said to uh, Zechariah, you're going to have a kid, you and your wife Elizabeth, you're old as anything, but you're going to have a kid you've been trusting for, it's amazing. And he says, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man, my wife is advanced in years. You ask God for stuff, he promises to give us, we come up with excuses why he can't. And the angel answered him, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and able to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. The word that God has given you will not be fulfilled in your time if you speak against it. So Zechariah, if you're going to speak against what God's doing, I'm going to shut your mouth because you will speak death against the promises of God. You will abort the promise of God through your speech. What have you killed? What have you killed? What ministry have you almost killed? It sounds harsh. God takes it seriously. All of creation was birthed, except man, was birthed by God's speech. But he makes us because he wants to breathe into us. Because he wants his breath, his speech to become our speech. But what happens is we believe the lie of the enemy. We do these things. We put our accounts, bill due, debt due. We stick it on our refrigerators. We leave it at the front table in our, at, our, at our office at home. So the first thing we see is that, and we go, oh, I'm never going to get that paid. The enemy goes, we're to agree. We're to agree. I agree with you, sir. You will never pay your debt. I agree with you. We're to agree on earth. Why do we partner with the lies of the enemy verbally? Oh, my parents got divorced, so will I. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Oh, no, I, this, you know, uh, uh, diabetes runs in the family. Cholesterol runs in the family. Heart disease runs in the family. No, the problem is nobody runs in your family. We speak, I cannot do this. The devil goes, I'll partner with that. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. 
We are the brethren. So he accuses us, and we go and agree. I, I've been in court a few times. Um, not always my own fault. But I've, I've had people that I've accused of doing things. And when I've, I once falsely accused somebody in court, and when it came time for me to go and share my testimony, I said to the prosecutor, it was a long case, and I said to the prosecutor, actually, what they're saying is true. Without hearing anything of the story, the judge ruled in favor of the one that was being accused because the accuser was agreeing with her. Are you with me? I was the accuser. I was falsely accusing her. I agreed with what she said. She was telling the truth. The case dies. If she had come and said, I plead guilty to what the accuser is saying, she would have gone to prison. Why do we agree with what the accuser is saying? So that he can destroy our lives. He says, the word says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Chapter John, uh, John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, I've come to give life and life in abundance. But then we speak death. He says, life and life in abundance. We, he goes, life and life in abundance. Life and life in abundance. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Can we perhaps start partnering those two scriptures to be, have it become relevant in our lives? He's speaking over your business. My business is prosperous. It's not name it, claim it, and frame it. It's easier. Name it. Speak life. Oh, you one of the word of faith people. Yes, I read the word, therefore I have faith. Are you speaking life? I can't play an instrument. Try. No, I can't, I can't sing, I know I can't. I'm all right to that. Speak life over your family. Most nights, some nights I've got this very endearing habit. My wife's gone to the loo, I can tell you quickly. I have this very endearing habit that at night... When I fall asleep, I purr. <laughs> well, snore, purr, it's semantics. <laughs> you know, I, it's this lovely, soothing sound. It's like, <clears throat> and it's just, it brings harmony <laughs> to all. Um, but more often than not, my wife falls asleep before me. And when she does, I lean over and I put my hand on her. And very quietly, I declare that I will be the husband that she deserves. And I will be the husband that will bring the best out in her. And I will be the husband that God wants me to be. Then I roll over and think, Phew, what a day tomorrow is going to be. <coughs> oh, are you just critical of your spouse? The silly jokes around family commenting that you can't cook, commenting all these small little things. I'm not going to list everything, but I promise you this year is only going to go downhill for you if you don't change the way you speak. So what about speaking over the prophetic words that have been placed over your life? Because that's what a prophetic word is. It's, it's placed on you. I take a prophetic word. It's, a prophetic word is not a what will be. It's a what can be. And I take a prophetic word and I go, I breathe life into this. So I eat the word of God and I speak over it. These are the promises of God over my life. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren will only see the glory of God. They will not see heartache and pain. My family has no bloodline curses but bloodline blessings. I'm of the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Do you do this? My church that I get to lead, and people go, well, it's God's church. No, because if it fails, it's my fault. My church that I get to lead, I have the absolute privilege of overseeing, goes from glory to glory because that's the promise of God. We do not shrink, we advance. Money is in surplus. We see healings every week. The devil has no access to me, and the devil will forget my name. It's promises of God. Or we can go, a whole lot of other stuff. And when I buy into it, my year will turn around. Because the word of God says so. We're having a prophetic vision. I'm running around naked. Where I speak death, it will die. Jesus curses a fig tree. Jesus curses an inanimate object. Well, not it's an organic object, but it doesn't have human life. It dies. Are we at a place where we can start walking in that power? You are. Can you stand with me, please?